Well, tonight we're in Revelation chapter 5. We're talking about worthy is the Lamb. And just as a little bit of review, remember that John finds himself in heaven. There was this open door, and he heard a voice saying, come up here. And so John then finds himself in spirit in heaven. Remember, he sees a throne. And seated on the throne is none other than God himself. And in the right hand of God, there is a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. There's also 24 uh, elders seated on 24 thrones around the throne. They're wearing white garments. They have crowns on their heads. And those crowns came because of rewards that they've received when they were here on earth. We believe the 24 elders represent the Old Testament and New Testament church. That is, all the saints in heaven at this particular time. There was also four living creatures flying around. They were uh, protecting the holiness of God. And remember, they began singing, holy, holy, holy. And they began to single out the greatest attribute of God, and that is his holiness. And then it wasn't long after that that the 24 elders began to praise God. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and praise for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And remember, they then stood up, and they cast their crowns before him who sits on the throne. Well, that's just a quick review of what we talked about last week. But here is what I want you to see. Last week, all the praise and all the honor went to him who sits on the throne. The praise went to God the Father. In our lesson tonight, here in Revelation chapter 5, the praise is directed toward the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the earth. And of course, that would be none other than Jesus Christ himself. So, let's get into our text. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, speak about the importance of the seven-sealed scroll. Notice the identity of the scroll. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. A couple of things about this scroll that I find interesting. Notice the source of it, because the word that is translated scroll in the Greek is the word biblos. And that ought to be familiar, because that's where we get the word Bible, and it simply means book. Now, this scroll is not the Bible, but certainly it might contain a portion of the Bible, maybe the rest of the book of Revelation for that matter. Now, just a little bit of information about scrolls. I've got more on your notes and what I'm going to recite tonight because I have far more important things to talk about, but you might find this interesting, that in biblical times, scrolls were made from eight by 10 inch papyrus or bulrush sheets, and they were glued together. The lettering on those scrolls was in narrow three inch columns three quarters of an inch between each column with two and a half inch margins, top and bottom. So when you recognize how scrolls were made back in those days, and if this certainly applied to the book of Revelation, then if you would unroll the entire book of Revelation, it would be 15 feet in length. Now notice the ceiling of the scroll. The scroll that was in the right hand of the Father is sealed with seven seals. Now, a seven-sealed scroll was a very common legal document back in ancient Rome. Under Roman law, marriage contracts, rental agreements, wills, title deeds, and all important documents were sealed with seven seals. Now, this is how it worked. You have the scroll. It's a legal document. And so you seal it by taking a needle with a piece of thread on the end, and you poke a hole with the needle through the scroll bringing the thread through, and then you tie the thread in a knot. And that thread, tied in a knot, became a seal on a legal document under the Roman Empire. And we said that all legal documents had seven seals. So there were seven pieces of thread throughout the document. But you had to have a witness for each of the seven seals. And so uh, to open that up, then these seven witnesses had to come back if that document was going to be uh, its contents uh, to be known. So you have seven seals, you have seven witnesses, and those seals were written on both sides. So on the front side of the scroll, 
or I should say the scroll was had writing on both sides. On the front side would be a general description of what the document was all about. And on the back side were all the details in regards to that particular document. So you can see that this scroll that is in the right hand of the Father, sealed with seven seals, is written on both sides. And so I believe this represents God's last will and testament. I believe it represents his title deed to the universe. And here's what I'm saying, and I think you'll see this much more as we move through the book of Revelation. From the very beginning, Satan has been in control of this world. He's the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. But our God is a sovereign God, and anything that Satan has done, God has allowed him to do it. In fact, there are times you're going to see where God actually uses Satan for the purpose of fulfilling his will. But there comes a time when God says, this universe is mine, I created it, and I am going to take it back. And so the scroll now is God's last will and testament. What he's really saying is, here is the plan by which I am going to take the world back from Satan. I am once again going to be in total control, and Satan is going to ultimately be cast into a bottomless pit, and finally into hell itself. So it's God's plan to take over what is rightfully his in the first place, but for all of these centuries has been under the control of Satan. So I believe that much of the content of this scroll contains the rest of the book of Revelation, because that is God's plan. The great tribulation is God's plan to take back that which rightfully belongs to him. Now notice the inquiry about who can open the scroll. You see this in verses 2 and 3. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Now I'm maintaining the strong angel in this case might well be Gabriel. The text doesn't tell us, but I'm just saying that's a good possibility because the word Gabriel means strength of God. And so here is this angel, we'll say it's Gabriel, he's flying through all the heavens, and he's saying, who is worthy to open the scroll? And there's total silence in heaven. You see, you have these four living creatures flying around, going in and around the throne. They don't say a word. You have the 24 elders sitting on the thrones, representing all the saints of the Old Testament, the New Testament. They don't say a word. You have all the apostles there. They don't say a word. You have myriads and myriads and myriads of angels. Not a peep out of any of them. You even have the reformers there. Some of the great people from out of the Old Testament, like uh, Moses and Abraham and Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth. None of them said a word. So, notice the impact on John, verse 4. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Now John is getting very emotional here. And this becomes a very strange verse, does it not? John is in heaven, and John's heart is sorrowful. And John is actually weeping in heaven out of sorrow because thus far no one has spoken up to say I am worthy to take the scroll and to break open the seals and reveal the content thereof. Now this might seem to contradict scripture a bit. For example if you get over to Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 it says this and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So now we've got a problem here. The scripture says there's no sorrow in heaven. There's no crying in heaven. God's going to wipe away all tears. And yet here's John up in heaven, and he's sorrowful, and he's weeping. So how do we resolve this problem? Well, here's how I resolve it. You may not like the answer, but <laughs> here's... The best answer I can come up with. In the present heaven, 
There well may be sorrow and there well may be tears. That's why I said last week when we talk about crowns, there may be embarrassment in heaven. Now, I don't think it's going to last long, but if somebody doesn't have a crown and they see everybody else laying their crown before him who sits on the throne, they might be a bit embarrassed because they did not work sufficiently to be rewarded with a crown. Here we see John sorrowing in heaven. We see John shedding tears in heaven. So I have to believe that in the present heaven, there well may be sorrow and there well may be some tears. I don't think that's going to be normal. I would hope not. But at least we see that's an experience that John is having. Now, the verse then in Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 does not apply to the present heaven. It applies to the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It applies to the time when eternity begins. That's the best answer I can come up with to see why John is sorrowful, why John is crying, and yet later on in the book of Revelation we see where there's no sorrow and no tears in heaven. So there may be a little difference between the present heaven and the future heaven. The future heaven, of course, being after the millennial reign of Christ on earth when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven and eternity begins. Now, we have to ask this question. Why is John so emotional? Why is he so upset? Because there's silence in heaven and no one seems worthy to be able to take the scroll from the hand of the Father and break open the seals. Let's bring John back down to earth for a moment. He's up in heaven, let's bring him down to earth, okay? Remember John had a brother by the name of James and they were the sons of Zebedee. And remember these two brothers went to their mother and said, that, Mom, do us a favor. Why don't you go before Jesus and say, Jesus, when you establish your kingdom here on earth, we want the chief seats. Uh, we want one of us to sit on your right hand and the other on your left hand. So, being mom, that's exactly what she does. She goes to Jesus with this request on behalf of her sons. Now, understand something. James and John did not understand at that time the purpose of Christ's ministry when he came to earth the first time. Jesus did not come the first time to establish his millennial kingdom or his reign on earth from the throne of David. But that was the very thing that the apostles thought he was here to do. They thought he was here to overthrow the Roman Empire, to get rid of Caesar, and to set up a kingdom whereby Israel would rule over the Gentiles and the Messiah himself would sit on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. That's what they believed. The entire time they were in the ministry of Jesus, that's what they believed. Remember when you get over to Acts chapter 1, what do you find there? Well, Jesus and the apostles are on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus is giving some final words to them. And then what do the apostles say? Lord, are you at this time now going to restore your kingdom? And what did Jesus say? It's not for you to know the times or seasons. And then he tells them to go out into the world and preach the gospel, and Jesus ascended into heaven. So it's interesting that these men spent three years with Jesus and never understood the purpose of his ministry. And so now here's John up in heaven. I want the kingdom to come to earth. Remember, they remembered that prayer of Jesus. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they thought Jesus was here to fulfill part of that prayer. And so John now is in heaven. He's experiencing the very presence of God himself. He sees this scroll 
He undoubtedly is curious as to what this scroll contains, but he believes that the contents of that scroll is going to reveal when Christ's kingdom is going to come to earth. But for the moment, he's lost hope. And that's why he's sorrowful. And that's why he's shedding a tear. Well, of course, uh, John did have an important part in the uh, ministry of Christ after Christ ascended. And we certainly talked about that, how he had much to do with the church at Ephesus, probably was uh, an elder in that church. And then uh, he was an individual, of course, that refused to uh, submit to Caesar worship. And that was the reason why he was dipped in a cauldron of boiling oil and sent to the Isle of Patmos where he was in exile. Then he was released at a very, very old age, came back to the church at Ephesus, and probably that's where he died. But this is the issue. The issue is John wants to know, when is that part of your prayer, Lord, going to be answered? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He didn't learn that when he was on earth. Now he's up in heaven and he still hasn't discovered when that is going to take place. Well, let's look at verses 5 through 7. It's the introduction of the one who is worthy. Now we see the assurance to John from one of the 24 elders here in verse 5. Notice. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So there's an elder who gets up and comes over to John, seeing how sorrowful he is, seeing he's shedding tears. Hey, don't weep. There's no need for you to weep because there is one here who is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. And then he identifies that one as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. So let's look at those two titles, because they're obviously they're titles of the Messiah. Well, the first thing we see is the lion of Judah. Remember there in the book of Genesis when uh, Jacob, who's the uh, father of the 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob's getting ready to die. And so he's calling each of his sons before him, and he's going to offer a blessing to them. Well, here's Judah coming before his father, Jacob. And uh, Jacob is blessing him by saying that he and his sons, they are lion's whelps. Because the uh, tribe of Judah was the kingly tribe. The tribe of Judah had as its enzyme a lion. And remember that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And so therefore he's being identified as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But there's something else you might find interesting here. As part of the talk that Jacob is giving to his son Judah, he says this. This I believe is verse 10 of Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Hmm. Let's break this verse down, because this is a very, very important verse. And I'll tell you why. It gives us an approximate time when the Messiah was to be born. How so, you say? Well, let's look at the word scepter. What does the word scepter mean? It refers to a staff that would be in the hands of the king. And so it demonstrated kingship. The king is the one who had the scepter. And remember, the tribe of Judah was the kingly tribe. But the scepter is not going to depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Now, the word Shiloh means Whose it is? Hmm. So whose what is? I guess we would have to ask. Well, to whom does the scepter belong? To the king. Pardon? It belongs to the king. 
Well, in this case, it belongs to Shiloh. And who is Shiloh? It's another title for the Messiah. See, in the Old Testament, you have many different names for the coming Messiah. He's called the branch. He's called Lord. Here he's called Shiloh. The Jews referred to the Messiah to come as Shiloh. Why? Because he is going to come as king. He is going to hold the scepter from the tribe of Judah. That's what the Jews believed. But notice what it says. Shiloh has to come before the scepter departs from Judah. So the scepter is going to depart from Judah. When did that happen? Well, there's a couple of dates we could bring up. The first date would be 7 A.D. What happened in 7 A.D.? That's when the Caesars of Rome decided to take all authority away from the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, where they could not crucify or execute anybody without Rome's permission. So, the Sanhedrin, they're the ones that determine who's going to be executed and who's not as far as the Jewish people were concerned. But now, at 7 AD, the Romans said, no, you can't do that. That's the reason why when the Sanhedrin tried Jesus, they had to turn him over to the Romans because the Sanhedrin did not have authority to kill Jesus. Okay. Jesus was already dead. What? When, what year did Jesus die? 30 AD, 33 AD. We're talking about 7 AD. I thought AD meant after death. What? No. No. Oh, you're the Lord. Yeah. Excuse me. That's all right. I want you to get this. Because, you know, this is a Jewish messianic class, so to speak. I at least I understand it that way. So here becomes an issue. The Orthodox Jew today is still looking for the coming of the Messiah, right? And yet this verse tells us the approximate time when the Messiah would be born. It has to be before 7 A.D. Well, when was he born? That becomes a question, but it ranges anywhere from 2 B.C. to 5 B.C., see? Because the calendar got off a little bit. So, we would say, at the time in which the Roman government took all authority away from the Sanhedrin to perform any executions... Jesus would be somewhere between 9 and 12 years of age. He was already born. If you want to carry it even further, remember what happened in 70 AD. That's when Titus of Rome marched his troops into Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and now the Sanhedrin no longer exists. They're gone altogether. So you could say 70 A.D. would be another day. Jesus would have to be born before 70 A.D., but I think a better argument is he would even have to be born before 7 A.D. Because that's when the scepter was removed from the tribe of Judah. Well, it's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And... Uh, we're going to actually see that he's a lamb, but he's also a lion. And so the lamb is the tamely part of Jesus and the meek part of Jesus. But uh, as we move through the book of Revelation, we're going to see he becomes a lion. He becomes a warrior. And he can growl when he comes back because he's going to subdue his enemies. Notice next he's called the root of David. So he's not only called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, he's called the Root of David. And every Jew believed their Messiah would come from the line of David. Even the Pharisees referred to Christ as the Son of David. But remember that David called him Lord, and Jesus points this out to the Pharisees, which only got them all the more confused. So God made a covenant with David. That through his bloodline, the Messiah would come and set up an everlasting kingdom. Remember, David was one who wanted to build the temple, right? And God says, no, you can't build the temple because you're a man of blood. I want your son Solomon to build the temple because he's going to be a man of peace. 
But what did David do? David still took up a big offering. He wanted something to do that is going to be part of getting this temple built. But uh, God did make a covenant with David, which we read there in 2 Samuel chapter 7. David, on your throne is going to sit the Messiah, and your throne will be an everlasting throne. Because through your bloodline, the Messiah is going to come. So the throne of David is going to be an everlasting throne. Jesus will sit on that throne during his millennial reign on earth. And of course, that's what John was wanting to happen and why he had uh, his mother go and talk to Jesus and why he's so mournful and shedding tears up there in heaven. When is the kingdom going to come to earth? Now, there's something very interesting here. Remember when Jesus was put on the cross, Pilate had a sign made, an epitaph. And that epitaph was in three different languages. It was in Hebrew, it was in Greek, and it was in Latin. And it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now let's look at the Hebrew. You know that the Hebrew, you read from right to left. We read from left to right, but in Hebrew, you read from right to left. If you would look at that as an acrostic, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, that acrostic would spell out the name of God, Yahweh. But it would be backwards to us. It would be H-W-H-Y. But remember how they read, from right to left. Isn't that astounding? That every Jew could look at the cross and see the epitaph written in their own language and just take the first letter of every word and it spells out, Jesus is the I am. Jesus is God. Yes? uh, I recently read someplace that... uh, Every person that was crucified had their crime that they were convicted yeah. of written on that sign. So mm-hmm. isn't it interesting what his crime was? He was king of the Jews. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, notice now the appearance of the worthy one there in verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders <coughs> stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So now we see the lion as a lamb. Here the elder has just said to John, you know, don't, don't cry. Everything's going to be all right. There's one who is worthy. The lion has prevailed, he says. And so here's John. Can't you just imagine? He's looking all around for the lion. Understand this is symbolic language. He's looking for the lion. And what does he find? A lamb. Now this idea of Jesus as lamb was certainly nothing new to scripture. In fact, uh, what is it? 20, uh, 29 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to as a lamb. John the Baptist declared him as such. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Peter spoke of the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Isaiah spoke of him as a lamb led to the slaughter. Now, here's something that's very, very interesting to hear. In the Greek language, there are two different words for lamb. They're very similar, but they're different. There's the word for lamb that means lamb. Okay? And then there's the word for lamb that means... The lamb that is going to be a sacrificial offering to God. For instance, in Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 19, as it's translated into the Septuagint, which is taking the Hebrew and translating it into the Greek language, uh, Jeremiah 11 verse 19 says, I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter. And the word that is translated lamb there refers to a sacrificial lamb, not just an ordinary lamb. So in the book of Revelation, what word do you think is used to speak about Jesus as a lamb? It is the sacrificial lamb. In other words, what John sees is the nail prints in his hands and his feet. 
He sees those scars. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to see Jesus with the scars on his hands and on his feet. Because he wants to show us, this is what I went through, that you might be here with me forever. Notice the lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. Well, this is pretty easy to figure out, I think. Seven is a number of perfection. And so you have seven horns. A horn is symbolic of power. So you have this lamb as being all powerful. And he's able to destroy Satan or do with Satan whatever he wants. He has seven eyes that speaks of his omniscience, which means he's all-knowing. And it also talks about the effect of the Holy Spirit upon him and his ministry. And that's the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit, which we've talked about. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Now let's look at verse 7. It's the act of the worthy one. Then he came, and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. What a moment that must have been, especially for John, right? Because now he finds, here is the lamb, and he is the one that is going to take that scroll and break open the seals one at a time. He is going to reveal the contents of God's last will and testament. He is going to reveal... What's in the title deed? He is going to let us know when God's kingdom is going to come to earth. And when God is going to take control of his creation. Because up to this point, Satan has been ruling. So beginning at chapter 6, which we're going to be next week. Let me say something about the lesson next week. It's going to be a hard lesson to listen to. It's going to be a very hard lesson to listen to. Uh, It may even be a bit repulsive to some of you. But I'm not going to hold anything back. You see? Uh, I'm I'm just going to, I'm going to be graphic. I'm going to tell it as it is. And I just hope you can handle it. But I'm kind of giving you a warning like it's... uh, I don't want to rate it X because it has nothing to do with immorality, but let's say it's R rated without any bad language (laughs) or immoral acts because we're going to break open the first four seals and we're going to see the four horsemen of the apocalypse and they talk about a counterfeit peace, then they talk about war. And we're going to look at what's going on in the world today and how close we are to war. It talks about famine. And I'm going to give you some graphic examples of what happens during a time of famine. And then it talks about death. Because the last horse upon which the Antichrist rides, I'm calling it corpse. So we're going to actually see four horses next week. The first horse, I'm going to name counterfeit. The second horse, I'm going to name conflict. And the third horse, I'm going to name uh, commerce. Because we're going to see where the Antichrist gets control of the economy, which actually brings about a famine. And the final horse is named corpse. I got my four C's. I named the horses. But that's just kind of where we're going next week. So I'm excited about the lesson. I'm just saying it's not going to be an easy lesson. I mean, you're not going to walk out here saying happy, happy, happy like I want you to feel, you know. But there are just parts of the book of Revelation that are very, very graphic. So next week... uh, We're going to start with chapter 6, and we're going to look at the events of the Great Tribulation. This, I think, is important, too. When we look at the judgments that are found in the book of Revelation, the judgments come in three forms. First form is that of a scroll, a seven-sealed scroll. The number seven is very prominent here, see. And you might remember that uh, 
between the sixth and the opening of the seventh seal, there's a reprieve. There's a, a, a little relief. There's a bit of hope. Because the first six seals are not very pretty. So you come now where before the seventh seal is opened, there's, there's this relief. It's like the Lord wants to give a little bit of hope and encouragement. Then the seventh seal is open, and what do you come to? Seven trumpets. Seven angels with seven trumpets. And then you come to uh, that gap between the sixth and the blowing of the seventh trumpet. It's the biggest gap uh, in the scriptures or in the book of Revelation. And uh, that's another relief point. Because when these angels blow the first six trumpets, it's not going to be fun for the people on earth. I'm glad we're out of here. I mean, that's the good news. We're out of here. And then when the seventh trumpet blows, you're going to see that there are, I think it blows throughout the second half of the tribulation. The whole tribulation, whole three and a half years. And from, the, as, from that seventh trumpet, you have seven more angels with seven bowls of wrath, and they just dump these bowls of wrath upon the earth. So, remember, when you look at the judgments in Revelation, seal judgments, trumpet judgments, bowl of wrath judgments. Well, let's take a break. And I'll be back in about 10 minutes, and we'll finish up our lesson. We'll, we'll start with verses, uh, uh, verse 8 and go through verse 14. Okay, I'm ready to finish up our lesson. Ed, is there anybody else out there? Are we all here? Looks like we're all here. Let me say something about the question and answer time, which comes up at the end of this month on Palm Sunday, uh, that would be the Tuesday after Palm Sunday or right before Easter. Uh, it, it, maybe you uh, don't have a question as much as you want to know what I think about a certain topic. So you can uh, write that out as well. So it may be uh, something that you already have an opinion on, but you'd like my opinion too. So you can... Uh, well, I'd like to get about 10 questions. I've got about three or four. Okay, well, you write them out and you get them to me. <laughs> I'll get through as many of them as uh, I can. Okay, we're going to finish up uh, chapter 5, and we're talking about the initiation of worship by singing a new song. And notice the reaction to the lamb taking the scroll. You see that in verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So we see, first of all, the worship of the Lamb. And here we have these four living creatures, these angels that protect the holiness of God. We see where they lie prostrate before the Lamb. Now, the praise comes in two forms here. They're praising the Lord, first of all, through music. Remember that each one had a harp. So I believe there's going to be musical instruments in heaven. It's strange. I, uh, I was raised in a, uh, what's called the restoration movement of Christian churches and churches of Christ. Now, not the non-instrumental branch. You might be familiar that there's a church of Christ that doesn't believe in use of musical instruments. In fact... Uh, what they would say is, if you sing with musical accompaniment, uh, that's the mark of the beast. And as a result, you're going to hell. And I've actually had pastors of the Church of Christ tell me, I'm going to hell. And the whole congregation, simply because we have musical instruments when we sing. Well, uh, I was asked by one of these gentlemen once to speak at a, a minister's meeting of pastors of... Uh, the Church of Christ on instrumental, and they wanted me to talk on why I believe the musical instrument is biblical. And so I decided that would be fun, I'll go and do that. <laughs> now I didn't realize that they like to debate. Well, it's me and all of these pastors out there, 40 or 50 of them. And so now they want a question and answer time. 
And so I said, okay, now I wasn't prepared for that, but okay, I'll take your question. So anyway, I got to a point where I, I said to them, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you allow weddings in your church? They, yeah, we do. Well, wonder what if the bride wants to have, here comes the bride played on an organ when she walks down the aisle. What do you do? Well, one of the pastors raised his hand and said, we roll up the windows of the church, we put the organ outside the building, and we let the sound come in. You see, the organ, the piano, they're instruments of sin because they're worldly instruments, and yet they have them in their homes. And so I said, why would you have a piano in your home if it is a sinful instrument? And the answer was? They don't like those kind of questions. <laughs> you see, they base this on what's called the silence of the Bible. Well, the Bible is not very silent in regards to musical instruments. The word psalm means to sing with a plucked instrument. That's what David did. He played the harp and sang songs. We're going to see in heaven these four living creatures each have a harp. Now, if it's all right to have a harp in heaven, what's wrong with having a harp in the church or a piano or an organ or drums? <laughs> what? Or a harmonica. Yeah. Now, they do have a pitch pipe. And so I got involved with that because they always have, you know, they want to start a song with a pitch pipe. So then I have another question. I said, now I understand that when you sing, you always want to get off on the right key. So the uh, one that's leading the worship uh, blows the right pitch through the pitch pipe. Yeah, we do. I said, well, pitch pipes aren't mentioned in the Bible. So how do you explain this? And here was the answer. I'll, I'll never forget it. Worship stops when the pitch pipe goes. But we use the pitch pipe for expediency because we want to get off on the right note. So as a result, we are glorifying God by our singing. So you, you worship, then you stop worship to hear the pitch pipe, then you start worship again. Now, those are the kind of answers you get. But anyway, very, very legalistic. And... Uh, so I just can't help but think of that when I see these four living creatures up in heaven, each having a harp. Music is going to be a very important part of praise. And also uh, prayer. Because notice now, they have these golden bowls of incense. And the golden bowls of incense represent the prayers of the saints. It goes back, of course, to the tabernacle and the temple. Remember in the holy place of the temple, one of the pieces of furniture was the altar of incense. <laughs> And twice every day, once in the morning and once in the evening, the priest would go into the holy place and he would put live coals in that altar of incense to keep the wreaths of smoke ascending up into heaven because that represented the prayers of the people. Now, what prayer is being uttered here? Well, I don't know for sure, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to get over to Revelation chapter 6. And we're going to see where you have these... Uh, for uh, you, you see the martyrs, rather. You see the martyrs who've come out of the great tribulation. They've been killed for their faith. They're now up in heaven. And you find these martyrs under the altar of incense. And they are praying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge the blood of those who dwell on the earth? Maybe that's part of the prayer. God, when are you going to put a stop to this carnage? When is your justice going to prevail? When are you going to avenge our blood and the blood of those who are still dying for their faith? Which raises an interesting question. How, does, uh, how do those who come out of the great tribulation up in heaven know how they got there? And how do they know that people still on earth are still being <coughs> martyred? Does that mean that we know something about what's going on on earth when we get to heaven? One answer might be, you know, there are people going to heaven all the time. So uh, maybe they're saying, hey, you know, this is still going on down there. Now that's one possible answer. The other possible answer is, is that there is 
some information that we know about what's going on. I'd like to know, for instance, does my late wife know what's going on in my life right now? Okay. Does she know that I'm remarried? Does she know where I live? Does she know I'm teaching a class here and Mariner's Church and so forth? Does she know that? Doesn't it seem like that no. would be a bad thing to not you personally? Yeah, I understand. Doesn't it seem like it would be bad for people to look down and see what's going on? I don't know that they can do that. Yeah. Not that you're a mess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I would say I would say I would say it from this standpoint. I would like to think that my wife remembers me. Remembers you and has thinks good things about you and sees the good things. And sees the good thing. Right. I would like to think that. You wouldn't want her you wouldn't want her I wouldn't want her to know I wouldn't want her to know everything going on, no. <laughs> I wouldn't want her to know no. And so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just throwing it out for an interesting conversation here because I don't know. What I do know is when we get to chapter 6 and we talk about the martyrs that came out of the Great Tribulation, they know how they got there and they know it's still going on on earth. And that becomes their prayer. Lord, when are you going to bring vengeance on those who are killing your people? Well, you can sleep on that. You know, it's just fun to talk about it. Notice now the worthiness of the Lamb. What was that? I missed something here. <laughs> what? <laughs> or have a nightmare. Oh, or have a nightmare. Okay. Verses 9 and 10. The worthiness of the Lamb. It says this. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. Notice there are four stanzas to this song. And this really is significant to me. Remember these are the four living creatures up there in heaven lying prostrate. And they're singing to the Lamb. Concerning the price he paid for our salvation. You were slain. So they know that Jesus Christ was crucified for people's sins so they could be there. Notice next. Concerning the purchase he made. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Concerning the people who are saved out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Concerning the positions of reigning on earth as kings and priests. And so they know that the day is going to come when Christ comes back again, establishes his kingdom, the church is going to come with him, and we're going to rule and reign with him. But of course, Peter had something to say about that as well, and as to who we are right now. He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and you're his own special people. Notice the response of all creation now. Now, all creation is joining in here. Verses 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all of them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Let me tell you a story. In, uh, in 2002, I took a group of young people from my church to Calcutta, India. I wanted them to uh, experience something of the Mother Teresa ministry. Not that I think she's a saint. But just because I think it would have been a good experience for them to go to the house of dying, to go to the house of the lepers, to go to uh, uh, the uh, orphanages that they have there and just see this particular ministry in a very dark and hopeless place. So I took about 25 young people with me and my wife went too. 
Let me say that Calcutta is probably the most hopeless place I've ever been in my life. The buildings were all dark. The plants were all dark because of the soot that came from the buses and it just belched out black smoke. Everything was black. You talk about smog in the 50s. That was nothing compared to what I saw in Calcutta. You could hardly see very far because everything was black. The buildings were just black. But you could walk down the street and there was a dead body lying there as though no one cared at all. Uh, I looked out my hotel window and there was a naked woman just sitting on the curb. And then the next morning, early, there's a flock of goats coming right down the main street of town. One day I'm out for a walk and there's a bull sitting right in the middle of the street. But one of the most depressing things was the main intersection in Calcutta, there was this beggar. He had no legs. They were cut off, uh, amputated by the local mafia. And they just bring him there, sit him down in the middle of a very busy intersection, and he's begging for money, but the mafia takes all the money. And so we were told, don't give any money because he doesn't get it. The only thing they do for him is keep him alive. Otherwise, he just sits there pleading for money I went to a, a Hindu temple, Kali, and one of the gods of the Hindus is named Kali, and the city of Calcutta is named after Kali. And so uh, you, you see this, this Hindu temple, and you see the people lined up uh, with the plants and flowers and something that they're going to offer the priests at the temple. And then they bring in two goats. And there's a little arena there in front of the temple and they have their little ceremony as to determine which goat's going to be the scapegoat. And then the other goat, they tie it up and then this uh, priest gets on a stand, a ladder, and he has a machete and he just whacks the head off of that goat and you just see that goat gun flying, the, the, the body of that goat flailing and kicking through the air. You take a ride down the Ganges River and you can see body parts floating by. And the reason why is because uh, somebody couldn't afford a $5 cremation. And so the only thing they do with the body then, if they can't get a piece of wood, which costs $5, and then they lay the person on this piece of wood and set the wood on fire and cremate them, uh, they just take the body and throw it in the river. Uh, a horse head just came floating by. I saw that. Uh, it's where they bathe. So they're out there bathing because it's a sacred river. And so I, I'm saying to myself, I have never been in a more hopeless place in my life. So Sunday comes. And we're going to go to church. So we heard about this Assembly of God church in town, and, and it was, uh, so we decided, well, uh, I don't know of any other church. We knew where it was located, so we decided to go to this Assembly of God church. The auditorium seated probably 2,500 people, and they had multiple services, and they were in English. The service we went to was an English service. The place was packed. Men came dressed in suits and ties. The women were dressed in their Sunday best. Then worship begins. And 2,500 people or more stand on their feet. And they begin to sing. To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Be glory and honor and power forever. To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Be glory and honor and power forever. I was familiar with that song. We sang that song in our church at that time. I couldn't sing. I couldn't sing. The tears were coming down my cheeks. I couldn't get a sound out of my voice. How could these people sing about a sovereign God? 
How could they give honor and glory to God when outside the building there's a dead body lying there and no one cares? There's a nude lady just sitting there on the curb. No one takes off a coat and covers her up. There's a beggar sitting in the main intersection of the town without any legs, can't even move. You can go to the house of the dying. It's the most hopeless place I've ever been. Because these people are just moments away from death and your responsibility is to change their clothes and give them a bath. Sometimes it takes a couple of people even to hold them up because they can't walk. Or you go to a leper colony. That was outside the church building. But those people sang like you don't hear singing in churches today. Hands raised. To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb be glory and honor and power forever. Wow. What a lesson that was for me. Every Christian ought to have experienced that. Because I tell you, it would change the way they look at life. It would change their relationship with God, to see people who seemingly would have no hope demonstrate hope. Well, notice uh, the number involved in the praise here. It talks about the voice of many angels, 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands and thousands, along with four living creatures, the 24 elders. They're all offering their praise here. And I'm just wondering, notice 1 Chronicles chapter 29. This deals with David wanting to build the temple, knowing he can't build the temple, so he takes this offering. He says, we're going to take an offering, and more money came in than, boy, he ever thought they would get. And so he's offering praise to God. Notice how similar David's prayer is to what these people are singing up in heaven. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. What a prayer. And yet how similar that prayer is to what was being sung up in heaven. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Well, notice the nature of the response, verse 12. You have a sevenfold praise here, and with this we'll close shop. Notice what they're singing. To him belongs the power. They're talking about the Lamb. To him belongs the power. Remember Paul called Christ the power of God. To him belongs the riches. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. To him belongs the wisdom. Because Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. To him belongs the strength. Because Christ is strong and can disarm the powers of evil and overthrow Satan. To him belongs the honor. Because the day is going to come when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. And to him belongs the glory. Because John said, we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And to him belongs the blessing. Because they sang, for you, God, are worthy. You, Lord, are the worthy one. And he shares all of his attributes and blessings to us because he gives us his power. He gives us his riches. He gives us his wisdom. He gives us his strength. He gives us his honor and he gives us his glory. And that's what I want you to leave with here today. I want you to leave here happy, happy, happy. I want you to leave here recognizing that Jesus Christ alone is worthy of our praise and our honor and our glory. Because he alone can take the scroll from the right hand of him who sits on the throne and begin to break open the seals. So next week, we're going to open four seals.
of the book of Revelation. You leave here happy tonight. You might not leave here happy next week. So that's it.